Before you listen, if you enjoy the stories and want to hear more, then please consider subscribing. Most of you listening aren't subscribed, so please take this time to subscribe. Turn on notifications so you'll never miss a story and be the first to hear. You'll also be supporting me. Thank you. I should have known something was off the moment I laid eyes on him. There was just something about the way he carried himself, the intense, almost predatory look in his eyes as they scanned the bar that set off alarm bells in my head. But I was feeling lonely that night, my self-confidence at a low ebb, and he seemed charming enough in his approach. So against my better judgment, I pushed aside those nagging feelings of unease and agreed to go out with him. The date started innocently enough, we met at a cozy little cocktail lounge downtown, the kind of place with dim lighting, plush leather chairs, and a sultry jazz soundtrack. He was polite, engaging in easy conversation, complimenting me on my appearance, and asking all the right questions to make me feel at ease. Despite my initial reservations, I found myself slowly letting my guard down, laughing at his witty quips and enjoying the attention. But as the evening wore on, little things began to nag at me, tiny red flags that I couldn't help but notice. The way he kept checking his phone, the furtive glances he kept throwing around the room, as if he was constantly on the lookout for something or someone. And then there was the incident with the waitress. When she brought our drink order, he snapped at her over something trivial, his tone harsh, his expression darkening in a way that was so at odds with the charming persona he'd been projecting. I started making excuses to wrap up the date early, but he was persistent. Hey, I know this great little spot we can check out. It's a little off the beaten path, but the drinks are amazing. What do you say? He said, that same intense look in his eyes. Despite every instinct telling me to decline, I found myself agreeing. We ended up at some seedy, dimly lit club on the other side of town, the kind of place that screamed danger. The music was pounding the air thick with cigarette smoke, and I felt incredibly out of place, my unease growing by the minute. He ordered us drinks and we found a table in the corner, away from the crowd. That's when I noticed the distinct bulge under his jacket. My heart started racing because I was almost certain that was the outline of a gun. I tried to act casual, to keep my expression neutral, but inside I was panicking. I needed to get out of here and fast. As he excused himself to use the restroom, I made my move. I quickly gathered my things and headed for the exit, my legs shaking the entire time. Just as I reached the door, I felt a strong hand on my arm kneeing me back. Where do you think you're going? He growled, his face twisted in anger. I stammered out some excuse about not feeling well, trying to remain calm, but he wasn't buying it. Oh, I don't think so, he hissed, his grip on my arm tightening. You and I are just getting started. At that moment, I knew I was in serious trouble. This man was dangerous, and he was not going to let me leave. I started to panic on my whirling as I tried to figure out a way to escape. Suddenly, I heard a commotion near the entrance, raised voices, the sound of sirens growing closer. The police, my heart soared with hope, even as my date's expression darkened. Time to go, he muttered, yanking me towards a back exit. I tried to resist to break free, but his grip was like iron. As we made our way through the dimly lit hallways, I could hear the sirens growing closer, and a glimmer of hope began to spark within me. We emerged into a dark alley, the only light coming from a flickering street lamp. My date was scanning the area, looking for a way to escape. This was my chance. Without thinking, I wrenched my arm free and took off running, adrenaline fueling my every step. I could hear him cursing behind me, his heavy footfalls pounding in pursuit. I weaved through the maze of alleys and side streets, my lungs burning, every muscle straining as I pushed myself to the limit. Finally, I saw the flashing lights of the police cars up ahead. Summoning the last of my strength, I sprinted towards them, screaming for help. The officers looked surprised, but quickly sprang into action, apprehending my date as he tried to flee. I collapsed on the sidewalk, shaking and gasping for breath. The police questioned me, and I recounted the terrifying events of the evening. They were stunned, and I could see the concern in their eyes. As it turned out, my date was a known criminal, wanted for a string of robberies and assaults. I had unwittingly become entangled in his web, and it was only by pure luck that I had managed to escape. I replayed that night over and over in my mind, haunted by the what-ifs and the close calls. 
I couldn't help but wonder what might have happened if I hadn't managed to get away, if the police hadn't arrived when they did. The experience left me shaken, my trust in others deeply shaken. It all started when I matched with this girl on a dating app. Let's call her Jenna. She was an absolute stunner with long brown hair, piercing green eyes, and a smile that could light up a room. We started chatting, and I was hooked from the first message. She was whip-smart with a sharp wit and a killer sense of humor. We bonded over our shared love of terrible puns and obscure indie vans. After a few weeks of non-stop texting, we decided to take the plunge and meet up in person. I was nervous as hell, but also excited. I spent hours picking out the perfect outfit, something that said, I'm cool and casual, but also put together. I must have changed my shirt at least five times before settling on a button down with rolled up sleeves. When the day of the date finally arrived, I was a ball of nerves. I got to the restaurant early, not wanting to keep her waiting. I sat at the bar, sipping a beer and trying to calm my racing heart. And then she walked in. I swear, time seemed to slow down. She was even more beautiful in person, with a confident stride and a dazzling smile. She spotted me and waved, and I felt like the luckiest guy in the world. We hugged, and I caught a whiff of her perfume, something floral and intoxicating. We sat down at our table, and the conversation flowed like wine. We talked about everything and anything. Our favorite books, our childhood pets, the weirdest food we'd ever eaten. She had me in stitches with her stories about her crazy college roommates and the time she got lost in Prague. I couldn't remember the last time I'd laughed so hard. As the night went on, I found myself getting lost in her eyes and the sound of her voice. She had this way of making me feel like I was the only person in the room, the only one that mattered. I was falling hard and fast, and I didn't even care. But then, just as we were finishing up our entrees, she leaned in close and said she had something to tell me. I figured it was going to be something cute, like she had a weird phobia or a secret talent for juggling. But no, it was nothing like that. With a serious expression on her face, she told me that she was married. And not just married, but married with three kids. I felt like I'd been punched in the gut. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. How could she have let me out like this? How could she have made me feel so special, so connected, when she had a whole other life that she kept hidden? She must have seen the shock and hurt on my face because she quickly started explaining. She said that she loved her husband and kids, but that she just needed a little excitement in her life. She wanted to have some fun to feel young and hot again. She gave me this pleading look like she was begging me to understand. But I couldn't understand. I couldn't wrap my head around the idea of being someone's dirty little secret, of sneaking around behind their spouse's back. I'm not that kind of guy and I never will be. I told her as much, trying to keep my voice steady even as my heart was breaking. She looked disappointed but not surprised. She said she got it, that she'd respected my decision. She even offered to pay for dinner, like that would somehow make up for the fact that she'd just shattered my trust and my hopes for a future together. I mumbled something about needing to get home and practically ran out of the restaurant. I couldn't get out of there fast enough. I felt like I was going to be sick like the walls were closing in on me. The whole ride home, I replayed the date over and over in my mind, trying to figure out where I had gone wrong. Had I been too eager, too desperate? Had I missed some obvious clue that she wasn't who she seemed to be? I beat myself up for being so stupid, so trusting. Over the next few days, I was a mess. I couldn't focus at work, couldn't eat, couldn't sleep. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw her face, heard her voice telling me about her double life. It was like a waking nightmare that I couldn't escape. I started to doubt everything about myself. Was I really that bad at reading people? Was I some kind of magnet for liars and cheaters? I even wondered if I was destined to be alone forever, doomed to have my heart broken over and over again. But slowly, painfully, I started to pull myself out of that dark place. I leaned on my friends and family for support, pouring my heart out to them over endless cups of coffee and late night phone calls. They reassured me that I hadn't done anything wrong, that I wasn't to blame for Jenna's deception. I started to see a therapist working through my trust issues and my fear of getting hurt again. It wasn't easy, but it was necessary. I learned to be kinder to myself, to forgive myself for not being perfect. I realized that one bad experience didn't define me or my worth as a partner. Gradually, I started dating it again. I was more cautious now and more guarded. I took things slow, really getting to know people before jumping into anything serious. 
I had a few false starts, a few awkward encounters, but I also had some really great dates with genuine, honest people who made me laugh and feel appreciated. And you know what? I'm actually kind of grateful for that terrible first date with Jenna. Don't get me wrong, it was a nightmare at the time. It taught me so much about myself, uh, what I want and need in a relationship. It showed me that I'm stronger than I ever knew that I can survive heartbreak and come out the other side. Hey guys, sorry for interrupting, but just a quick announcement. First of all, if you're still listening, then you're amazing. Thank you for listening and supporting. Our team worked tirelessly day and night to produce these amazing stories for you. That's why we set up a Buy Me a Coffee page where you can show your support by generously donating a coffee or two to our team to keep us energized. It isn't much, but will surely go a long way. It's totally your choice, but would be absolutely amazing if you could. Again, thank you for your support. The link is in the bio and comments. Back to the stories. Maybe it was the way he carried himself, all cocky swagger and titled arrogance, like the world owed him something. Or maybe it was the unsettling predatory gleam in his eyes as they raked over me. A cold sensation went down my spine. Either way, every fiber of my being was screaming at me to turn around and walk the other way. But you know how it goes. When you're feeling lonely and desperate for some company, even your instincts can get overruled by your heart. And let's be honest, he was pretty easy on the eyes. So against my better judgment, I ignored that nagging sense of unease and agreed to meet up with him for a casual coffee date. At first, he played the part of the charming, attentive suitor to perfection. He cracked jokes, asked all the right questions, and had me laughing and engaged in no time. I'll admit, I started to let my guard down, lulled into a false sense of security by his effortless charisma. Maybe I had to judge him too harshly, I thought. Maybe this wouldn't be so bad after all. But then slowly, the cracks in that carefully crafted facade began to show. The way his brow would furrow, his expression darkening at the slightest provocation. The thinly veiled aggression that seemed to simmer just beneath the surface, ready to boil over at any moment. And when the barista accidentally spilled a bit of his coffee, the way he reacted, his face contorting in pure rage, his body tensing up like a coiled spring, it sent a chill down my spine. I tried to steer the conversation in a lighter direction, to shift the mood and pretend I had noticed the disturbing shift in his demeanor, but he wasn't having it. Instead, he started making these bizarre, unsettling comments about my appearance. Little nitpicky observations that made me feel incredibly self-conscious. You know, that shirt really doesn't do you any favors, he said, his eyes roaming up and down my body in a way that made my skin crawl. You look so much better in something tighter, something that really shows off your figure, you know. I felt my cheeks flush with a mixture of anger and discomfort. Who the hell did this guy think he was, commenting on my appearance like that? I opened my mouth to get him a piece of my mind, but the look in his eyes stopped me cold. There was a darkness there, a dangerous glint that made my heart skip a beat. Suddenly, I was acutely aware of how isolated we were, tucked away in the corner of this tiny coffee shop. The thought of being alone with this unstable, potentially violent person made my palms sweat. Muttering some lame excuse about needing to use the restroom, I practically sprinted to the safety of the ladies' room. As I splashed cold water on my face, trying to calm my racing heart, I knew I had to get out of here. This day had gone from mildly uncomfortable to outright terrifying, and I wasn't about to stick around to see what else this guy might be capable of. When I emerged, he was waiting for me, that unsettling smile still plastered across his face. Ready to get out of here, he asked and the way he said it made my skin crawl. I stammered out some excuse about having a work commitment, but he wasn't having it. Oh, come on, don't be like that. I was just getting warmed up. His eyes narrowed, a dark edge to his voice that scared me. I backed away instinctively, my heart pounding in my chest. I really should get going, I said, trying to sound casual, but my voice betrayed the fear I was feeling. He took a step towards me, and I instinctively flinched. That seemed to amuse him, and a disturbing grin spread across his face. What's the matter? Don't you trust me? He asked, his tone dripping with sarcasm. I didn't stick around to find out. Without a second thought, I turned and fled, practically running out of that coffee shop and down the street. I didn't stop until I reached my car, 
fumbling with my keys as I glanced nervously over my shoulder, half expecting to see him in hot pursuit. As I drove home, my mind was racing, replaying every unsettling moment of that disastrous date. What the hell was wrong with that guy? And more importantly, what the hell would he have done if I hadn't gotten out of there when I did? The thought disturbed me greatly. I had a feeling that I had narrowly escaped something truly horrific, that I had come face to face with a dangerous, unstable individual who wouldn't have hesitated to hurt me. In the days that followed, I found myself constantly on edge, jumping at every unexpected sound and glancing warily over my shoulder. I couldn't stop thinking about those dark, intense eyes, the way his expression had shifted from charming to positively chilling in the blink of an eye. It was a sobering reminder that sometimes, the scariest monsters are the ones who seem the most normal on the surface. That the people we think we can trust the most can turn out to be the biggest threats of all. I vowed then and there to never let my guard down again, to always trust my instincts, no matter how charming or nice someone might seem, because you never know what kind of darkness might be lurking beneath the surface. As for that guy, well, I reported him to the police, giving them a detailed description and everything I knew. Turns out he was already on their radar for a string of violent assaults, and my report was the final piece of the puzzle they needed to bring him in. I can't say I'm thrilled to have been involved, but at least I know he's off the streets, or he can't hurt anyone else. I'll admit it, I'm not usually one for the whole online dating scene. The whole thing just feels a little too forced and artificial for my tastes, like you're just swiping through a catalog of potential partners, picking and choosing based on a carefully curated set of photos and a surface level bio. Not really my style, yo. But when Ava messaged me on that dating app, I don't know, there was just something about her that piqued my interest. Her profile pics were absolutely stunning. This gorgeous, slender brunette with the most infectious, enchanting smile. And the way she wrote with this quirky, playful charm, it just sucked me right in. So against my better judgment, I decided to give it a shot and agreed to meet up with her for a casual coffee date. The morning we were supposed to meet up, I'll confess, I was actually kind of excited. I put a little more effort into my appearance than usual, even went so far as to splash on some of that fancy cologne I usually save for special occasions. Play it cool, but don't look like you're trying too hard. I told myself as I headed out the door, butterflies fluttering in my stomach. When I arrived at the little cafe, I scanned the room, my eyes immediately landing on a woman who could only be Ava. And let me tell you, she looked nothing like her photos. Instead of the slender, gorgeous girl I was expecting, there was this. Well, let's just say she was a little more on the, shall we say, hefty side. I'm not trying to be a shallow jerk or anything, but the difference was honestly jarring. It was like those carefully curated profile pics had been edited or something. There's no way this woman in front of me was the same person. I mean, her face was similar, I guess, but the rest of her just didn't match up at all. For a moment, I just kind of froze, not really sure how to proceed. Part of me wanted to turn around and bolt, to just bail on this whole thing and make up some excuse. But then I saw the hopeful, nervous look on her face as she waved me over, and I felt a pang of guilt. This was probably a really sensitive topic for her, and the last thing I wanted to do was hurt her feelings or make her feel self-conscious. So I sucked it up, put on my best fake smile, and made my way over to her table. Ava, hi. It's so great to finally meet you in person. I said, doing my best to sound casual and upbeat, even as my mind raced with a million thoughts. She beamed at me, seemingly oblivious to my momentary hesitation. I'm so glad you made it. I was worried you might not show up, she said her voice lilting with nervous excitement. We settled in, and I did my best to make polite conversation to keep things light and friendly. But the whole time, I couldn't help but feel increasingly uncomfortable. Every time she shifted in her seat, I find my eyes drawn to her larger than expected frame, my mind racing with a thousand questions. Does she know how different she looks from her photos? I wondered. Is she aware of how much of a mismatch there is, or does she really think she's fooling anyone? The whole thing just felt so dishonest, you know. And then there were the little tells, the way she'd self-consciously adjust her clothing, the fleeting look of insecurity that would flash across her face whenever our eyes met. It was clear she was aware of the discrepancy, and it was making her deeply uncomfortable. As the date wore on, the tension only grew thicker. 
I found myself struggling to maintain eye contact to engage in the conversation. Every time there was a lull, I found my gaze drifting to her figure, my mind whirring with questions and discomfort. Finally, I just couldn't take any more. I made up some excuse about having an early morning and hastily excused myself. Ava looked crestfallen and I felt a pang of guilt, but I just couldn't bring myself to sit through another minute of that painfully awkward encounter. As I hurried out of the cafe, I couldn't help but replay the whole thing in my mind. What the hell was that? Had she really thought she could just show up looking nothing like her photos and everything would be okay? And why did I feel so damn uncomfortable about the whole thing? It's not like I was the one who misrepresented myself, right? I spent the rest of the day in a weird funk, that unsettling encounter weighing heavily on my mind. Part of me felt bad for Ava, for the obvious insecurity and discomfort she must have been feeling. But another part of me was just irritated. Irritated that she'd put me in that position that she'd essentially lied to me about her appearance. And the more I thought about it, the more I started to wonder, what else might she be hiding? what other secrets or skeletons might be lurking in her closet. The whole thing just left me feeling deeply unsettled, like I caught a glimpse of something dark and unsettling beneath the surface. I'll be honest, I don't think I'll be trying the whole online dating thing again anytime soon. That experience with Ava just reinforced everything I already disliked about it. The fakeness, the dishonesty, the sense that you're never really getting to know the person behind the carefully curated profile. At the end of the day, I guess the moral of the story is, you can't always trust what you see online. Sometimes the person staring back at you from those carefully selected profile pics isn't the same one you end up meeting in real life. And that can make for one hell of an uncomfortable, not to mention potentially dangerous, situation. So yeah, call me old fashioned, but I'll stick to meeting people the good old fashioned way, face to face with no filters or photo editing tricks to hide behind. At least that way, you know what you're getting. And hey, who knows, maybe I'll even find someone who looks just as good in person as they do online. A guy can dream, right? Listen, I'll level with you. I'm not exactly the type of guy who's out there swiping right and going on a million first dates. The whole song and dance of getting to know someone new just isn't really my thing, you feel me? Too much small talk, too much pressure to be all charming and witty. I'd much rather just skip the formalities and get to the good stuff, you know. But when this chick named Dilia hit me up on that dating app, I don't know, something about her just piqued my interest, you feel. She had this confidence about her, this killer sense of humor that had me cracking up every time we messaged back and forth. And let's be real, she was easy on the eyes, too. That sleek black hair, those intense green eyes. I figured, ah, what the hell, why not give it a shot? So we agreed to meet up at this cozy little cafe downtown, and I have to admit, I was actually kind of stoked. I even busted out the nice shirt, splashed on a little cologne for good measure. Gotta make a good first impression and all that right. When I walked in and spotted Dilia sitting at a table in the back, I have to say, I was pretty damn impressed. She looked just as fine in person as she did in her photos, maybe even more so. And she had this presence about her, this aura of total confidence that just drew me in. We exchanged the usual pleasantries, ordered up some coffee, and settled in for what I assumed would be your standard run-of-the-mill first date. You know, the whole getting to know you spiel, where you from, what do you do, blah blah blah. But then, as we kept talking, Delia started to veer in a, let's just say, more unsettling direction. She started going on about this trip she took to South Africa a while back, how she got to try all kinds of crazy exotic foods while she was over there. Oh man, you should have seen some of the stuff they served at this one place we went to, she said, her eyes practically sparkling with excitement. They had roasted ostrich, grilled spring milk, even some kind of. Well, let's just say it wasn't your average beef or chicken, if you catch my drift. I felt the chill run down my spine as the implication sank in. Was she seriously implying what I thought she was implying? My mind immediately went to the worst possible conclusion, that she had actually eaten human flesh or something. I tried to play it cool to convince myself that I was reading too much into it. Maybe she was just talking about some rare, obscure animal delicacy that I wasn't familiar with. But as Delia kept going on about the unique flavors and textures of the dishes she'd sampled, I couldn't shake the growing sense of my knees. And then she dropped the real bombshell. You know, I have to say, human meat is actually way more delicious than you'd think. 
It's got this really rich, almost nutty flavor to it. Once you get past the initial taboo, it's actually quite a delicacy. I felt the blood drain from my face as the words hit me. This woman, this seemingly charming and confident woman that I had agreed to go out with, was basically admitting to being a, a freaking cannibal. I wanted to puke to get the hell out of that cafe and never look back. But somehow, I managed to keep my cool to maintain this neutral expression as my mind raced. I had to get out of there, but I also couldn't just bolt without trying to get more info to really understand the full scope of what I was dealing with. So I kept playing along, asking a few more probing questions, trying to get a sense of how deep this rabbit hole went. And with each passing minute, the pit in my stomach just kept getting deeper and deeper. Delia recounted these stories of her culinary adventures with such casual, nonchalant glee that it made my skin crawl. She talked about how she'd first discovered this taste for the exotic during her travels, how she'd been seeking out increasingly rare and taboo ingredients ever since, and the way she described it and the way her eyes lit up. It was like listening to some twisted fuyu waxing poetic about their new favorite dish. Finally, I just couldn't take it anymore. I made up some excuse about an early morning and hastily excused myself. As I hurried out of that cafe, I could feel Delia's eyes burning into the back of my head, and I swear I've never power walked so fast in my life. Once I was a safe distance away, I collapsed against a nearby wall, my heart pounding in my chest. What the actual hell just happened? Had I really just sat across the table from a self-proclaimed cannibal sipping coffee and making small talk like it was the most normal thing in the world? I spent the rest of the day in a total haze, that conversation replaying over and over in my mind. Part of me wanted to call the cops to report Delia and everything she told me. But then again, what if she was just messing with me, you know? What if it was all some twisted joke and I had just overreacted and blown things way out of proportion? Either way, one thing's for sure, I'm never going on another first date again. The whole experience left me feeling shaken, violated even. I can't trust anyone, can't let my guard down for a second, because who knows what kind of twisted, dark secrets might be lurking just beneath the surface. You know, looking back on it, the first red flag should have been the way Amber's photos on that dating app looked almost too good to be true. I mean, this girl was straight up model material. The kind of stunner you'd expect to see gracing the cover of a glossy magazine, not swiping away on some online dating platform. But hey, I figured, maybe she was just one of those annoyingly photogenic types. And to be honest, her profile was so charming and witty that I couldn't resist giving it a shot. So we agreed to meet up at this cute little cafe downtown, and I'll admit, I was actually kind of excited about it. I even put a little extra effort into my appearance, busting out the nice shirt and splashing on a touch of cologne. Gotta make a good first impression right. And when I walked in and spotted Amber sitting at a table in the back corner, I have to say, she looked just as drop-dead gorgeous in person as she did in her photos. Maybe even better if I'm being totally real. She had this magnetic presence about her, this effortless cool that just drew me in the moment our eyes met. We exchanged the usual pleasantries, ordered up some coffee, and settled in for what I assumed would be your standard first date fare. The whole getting to know you song and dance, you know. And for a little while, that's exactly what it was. Amber asked me about my job, my hobbies, all the typical questions you'd expect. And I have to admit, I was actually enjoying myself. This chick was funny, charming, and easy on the eyes. What more could a guy ask for, right? But then, as we kept talking, I started to notice something a little off. The way Amber would casually drop these little details about her life. These random facts that just didn't seem to add up. One minute she'd be telling me about her high-powered corporate job, complete with all sorts of impressive-sounding job titles and accomplishments. The next, she'd be going on about how she spent last summer backpacking through Europe, living out of a hostel. It was like she was constantly trying to one-up herself to paint this picture-perfect image of her existence. At first, I chalked it up to her being nervous, maybe trying a little too hard to impress me. But as the date wore on, the lies just got more and more outrageous. Suddenly, Amber was this world-class chef who had cooked for A-list celebrities. Then she was a former Olympic athlete, a published author, and a multilingual genius. It was like she had an endless repertoire of bogus credentials and experiences to pull from, each one more unbelievable than the last. 
I just sat there listening in stunned silence as she rattled off these increasingly ridiculous tales. Part of me wanted to call her out to put an end to this charade. But another part of me was almost mesmerized, you know. I mean, the sheer audacity of it all, the way she delivered these lies with such confidence and charm. It was kind of captivating in a twisted way. Finally, I just couldn't take it anymore. I made some excuse about an early morning and hastily excused myself, practically sprinting out of that cafe. As I walked away, I could feel Amber's eyes boring into the back of my head, and I swear I've never power walked so fast in my life. Once I was a safe distance away, I just kind of stood there, replaying the whole bizarre encounter in my head. What the actual hell had just happened? Had I really just sat across the table from some compulsive liar, listening to her rattle off one absurd claim after another with a straight face? I spent the rest of the day in a total daze, that conversation haunting me. Part of me wanted to track Amber down to confront her and demand to know the truth. But then again, what good would that do? It's not like she was going to suddenly start telling the truth, right? She clearly mastered the art of the lie of creating these elaborate fantasies to impress anyone who would listen. And you know the more I thought about it, the more I realized that the scary part wasn't even the lies themselves. It was the unsettling realization that I had no idea who this woman really was or what else she might be hiding beneath that charming, confident facade. For all I knew, she could be a sociopath, a criminal, or some other kind of twisted individual, and I had absolutely no clue. So where does that leave me, huh? Well, let's just say I'm definitely not rushing to sign up for any more online dates anytime soon. Because at the end of the day, the moral of the story is pretty simple. We can't always trust what you see on the surface. Sometimes, the scariest monsters are the ones that hide in plain sight, cloaked in charm and charisma. And the only way to protect yourself is to keep your guard up, to trust your instincts, and to never, ever let that guard down. Because who knows what kind of twisted secrets might be lurking just beneath the facade. Alright, so, picture this, I was practically bouncing off the walls with excitement for my first date with Alex. We'd been chatting online for what felt like an eternity, and every conversation left me more and more convinced that they were my perfect match. I'm talking soulmate level connection here. They had this way of making me laugh until my sides hurt, and their intellect was just off the charts. Every time my phone buzzed with a new message from them, I couldn't help but grin like a fool. When the day of the date finally arrived, I must have spent hours getting ready. I tried on every outfit in my closet, agonizing over which one would make the best impression. I wanted everything to be absolutely perfect, you know. I even practiced my smile in the mirror, trying to strike that balance between friendly and flirtatious. I arrived at the restaurant a few minutes early, my heart pounding in my chest. And when I saw Alex waiting for me, I squeared my jaw and nearly hit the floor. They were even more stunning in person than in their photos with this magnetic presence that just drew me in. As they wrapped me in a warm hug, I felt this instant sense of comfort and familiarity. I had known them for years. We sat down at our table, and the conversation started flowing like wine. It was almost eerie how effortlessly we clicked, like we were two puzzle pieces that had finally found each other. We talked about everything under the sun, our childhood dreams, our biggest fears, our wildest aspirations. I found myself opening up to Alex in ways I never had with anyone else, sharing parts of myself that I usually kept hidden away. As the evening went on, I could feel myself falling harder and harder. Alex was just so attentive and engaged, hanging on my every word like I was the most fascinating person they'd ever met. They had this way of making me feel seen, heard, and understood in a way that I'd never experienced before. It was intoxicating. But then, just as I was starting to think that this might be the start of something truly special, the night took a bizarre turn. Alex excused themselves to go to the restroom, flashing me a reassuring smile as they walked away. But as the minutes ticked by with no sign of their return, a knot of unease began to form in the pit of my stomach. At first, I tried to brush it off. Maybe the line for the bathroom was just really long, or maybe Alex had gotten stuck in a conversation with an old friend. But as more and more time passed, my anxiety grew. I sent a couple of texts, tried calling their phone, but got no response. I even flagged down our waiter to ask if they'd seen Alex leave, but they just shook their head, looking as confused as I felt. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, 
I decided to check the bathrooms myself. I pushed open the door with trembling hands, half expecting to find Alex passed out on the floor or something equally alarming. But the bathroom was empty, no sign of them anywhere. Back at our table, I noticed a folded napkin on Alex's side, one that definitely hadn't been there before. My heart in my throat, I reached for it, unfolding it with shaking fingers. There was scrawled in Alex's handwriting was a message that made my blood run cold. I'm sorry, but I can't do this. It's not you, it's me. Please don't try to find me. I stared at the words, reading them over and over again, trying to make sense of them. How could Alex just disappear like that after the incredible connection we forged? What had I done wrong? Was it something I said, something I did? I felt like I was going to be sick. In a daze, I paid the bill and stumbled out of the restaurant, my mind reeling. Over the next few days, I tried everything I could think of to get in touch with Alex, desperate for some kind of explanation or closure, but it was like they had vanished off the face of the earth. Their social media profiles were gone, their phone number was disconnected, and none of our mutual friends had heard a peep from them. As the weeks turned into months, I couldn't ignore the feeling that something wasn't right. Alex had seemed too perfect, too in sync with me, to just disappear like that. I started to wonder if any of it had been real, if I'd just been projecting my own fantasies and desires onto them. The experience changed me in ways I never could have anticipated. It made me warier, more guarded with my heart. I found myself constantly looking over my shoulder, wondering if Alex was out there somewhere, watching me, laughing at how easily they'd been able to play me. The cryptic message they'd left behind haunted my dreams, haunting me with its ambiguity. Even now, years later, I still catch myself thinking about that night sometimes. Wondering if Alex ever spares a thought for me, if they feel even a shred of regret for the way things ended. But I try not to dwell on it too much. I've learned the hard way that you can't let the mysteries and betrayals of the past consume you, or you'll never be able to move forward. So I focus on the present, on the people who have proven themselves worthy of my trust and my love. I cherish the moments of joy and connection that come my way, knowing all too well how fleeting they can be, and I hold on to the hope that someday I'll find someone who sees me, really sees me, and who won't disappear when things get real. Because in the end, that's all any of us can do. Keep putting one foot in front of the other, keep opening our hearts even when it's scary, and keep believing that somewhere out there, there's someone who will stay, no matter what. If I'm really lucky, maybe I'll find them before too much more time slips away. Hey, sorry, I'm a bit late. Traffic was a nightmare, he said, sliding into the seat across from me. I forced a smile, silently reminding myself to keep an open mind. Maybe I was just being paranoid. But as the conversation progressed, I couldn't help but notice the way he seemed to know so much about me. My job, my family, even my favorite coffee order. At first, I chalked it up to him having done his homework, but the more he talked, the more uneasy I felt. He asked probing questions, delving into the details of my life in a way that felt almost invasive. Where did I grow up? What were my hobbies? Who were my closest friends? I answered politely, but inside, alarm bells were going off. How did he know all this stuff? As the date wore on, I caught him stealing glances at his phone, almost as if he was checking it for something. And every time the door to the coffee shop opened, he'd subtly turn his head, scanning the new arrivals. It was like he was on the lookout for someone or something. I started making excuses to wrap things up early, but he was persistent. Hey, I know this great little wine bar we should check out. What do you say? His eyes were locked on mine, intense and unblinking. Against my better judgment, I agreed. After all, what harm could it do? We'd be in a public place surrounded by people. And maybe I was just overreacting, reading too much into harmless behavior. Boy, was I wrong. The wine bar was dimly lit with plush leather couches and low tables. As we settled into a secluded corner, my date's behavior only grew more erratic. He kept checking his phone, his brow furrowed in concentration. And every time someone new walked through the door, he'd subtly turn to get a better look at them. I tried to engage him in conversation, to steer things in a more normal direction, but he seemed distracted, his responses short and evasive. That's when I noticed it, a piece of paper sticking out of his jacket pocket partially obscured. I couldn't make out what it was. Suddenly, he excused himself to use the restroom. 
Without hesitating, I leaned forward and carefully pulled the paper from his pocket. What I saw next made my blood run cold. It was a printout filled with details about my life, my address, my work schedule, even the license plate of my car. At the top, in bold letters, were the words, Surveillance Report. I felt like I was going to throw up. This man, the stranger I had agreed to go on a date with, had been stalking me. All those coincidences, all those unsettling details he knew about me, it had all been part of a calculated plan. Hands trembling, I quickly put the paper back and tried to compose myself as he returned to the table. I needed to get out of here and fast, but as I made a move to stand up, he fixed me with that same intense stare. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest as I heard. I just remember I have an early morning tomorrow. I stammered, cursing myself for sounding so unconvincing. He leaned back in his seat, a slow smile spreading across his face. Oh, I don't think so. We're just getting started. In that moment, I knew I was in real danger. This man, the stalker, had no intention of letting me leave. I had to think fast to find a way to get out of this situation. Summoning every ounce of courage, I stood up and made a beeline for the exit. I could feel his eyes boring into my back as I pushed through the crowd, adrenaline coursing through my veins. Just as I reached the door, I heard a commotion behind me. Glancing over my shoulder, I saw my date shoving his way through the other patrons, his face twisted in rage. Without hesitating, I flung the door open and ran, my legs pumping furiously as I navigated the dimly lit streets. I didn't stop until I reached my car, fumbling with my keys as I glanced nervously over my shoulder. Thankfully, there was no sign of my stalker. I peeled out of the parking lot, my heart still racing, and headed straight for the police station. As I recounted the terrifying events of the evening, the officers were stunned. They had been following my day for weeks, piecing together a trail of victims and building a case against him. Apparently, I had just narrowly avoided becoming his latest target. In the days that followed, I was a nervous wreck, constantly looking over my shoulder, jumping at every unexpected sound. The thought that this man had been watching me, cataloging my every move, filled me with a deep, visceral fear. But eventually, the police assured me that he was behind bars, awaiting trial for his crimes. It was a small comfort, but one that allowed me to slowly start rebuilding my shattered sense of security. Even now, years later, I can still feel the lingering effects of that terrifying first date. The way my heart pounds whenever I hear an unfamiliar noise. The way I double-check my locks before going to bed. It's a scar that will never fully heal, a constant reminder of the dangers that can lurk beneath the surface of even the most innocuous encounters. But I'm alive and I count that as a victory, and I'll never ignore my gut instinct again, no matter how charming or normal someone might seem. Because sometimes, the scariest monsters are the ones that walk among us, hiding in plain sight. Thanks for listening in. If you like these stories and want to hear more, then please subscribe and like and support this new channel. We have more stories for you to listen to.